It's part of the uh, BTC 281 bioprocessing class. Um, we express green fluorescent protein in E. coli. And in, in order to do a bulk production, um, we look at the process of um, fermentation uh, using um, fermenters. And in class, we'll be using the uh, one liter fermentation vessel. Um, I have um, two of the vessels here. One is exploded uh, and one is reasonably intact. Um, and so the point of this um, video is um, how ultimately to assemble the vessel and to um, get the vessel attached to the control unit and up and running. And so the first thing about operating fermentation vessels is their, f their function. Their function is to control the environment that you're growing the bacteria in. And we have a control unit that monitors uh, each of the parameters that we're interested in from the fermentation vessel and then exhibits or elicits some kind of control on the vessel to control that parameter. Um, in general, we refer to these as control loops. So we have a control loop for temperature that would maintain the vessel at the optimum operating temperature um, for that um, particular um, expression of the protein. Um, and that may be a temperature that's different than the optimal growth temperature for the bacteria. Uh, for instance, the expression of the green fluorescent protein in E. coli occurs at about 33 degrees centigrade, which is lower, a little lower than the optimal growth temperature of the E. coli, which would be 37 degrees centigrade. So it's all about um, controlling the environment that the bacteria are in to receive or to achieve the optimal expression of the protein of interest. Um, like I say, we, we call these methods of control, we call them control loops. So, for instance, the temperature control loop requires a monitor, which would be a thermocouple that actually monitors the temperature in the vessel, sends that information to the control unit. The control unit then either warms the vessel if the temperature is too low, or can actually then cool the vessel if the temperature exceeds um, the desired temperature. So that would be the control, route, um, contr control loop, a monitor to send information to the control unit and then some way for the control unit to, um, uh, to control that. So when we actually um, assemble the vessel and hook it up to the control unit, we'll be looking at each one of those um, uh, control loop. For instance, what we'll also be looking at dissolved oxygen. So the bacteria need uh, oxygen to grow and to get their optimal um, um, growth and production of the protein, then we need to control the oxygen level in the fermenter. Well, once again, that requires a probe that we'll be showing. This is a dissolved oxygen probe that monitors the amount of dissolved oxygen in the media, sends the signal to the control unit which then attempts to um, increase the uh, oxygen level. And it can do that by um, uh, either increasing the oxygen that we'll be putting into the vessel or by increasing the agitation rate because the agitation of the vessel creates turbulence that helps incorporate the oxygen that's percolating through um, um, the media. Uh, up to a certain point, you don't want your agitation rate to get too high, so you start shredding your bacteria and creating a big foam. Um, uh, so we'll be looking at that control loop because it consists of a motor and um, a impeller that actually stirs the contents and a baffle which is inside the vessel and creates a resistance to the turbulence that creates 
more turbulence and incorporates more oxygen. Okay. Okay, so one, one of the things we're going to look at here is we're going to be talking about the anatomy of um, the vessel and the parts that go into its operation. Um, and we've talked about the control loops and all the monitoring and potential additions to the fermenter. And this happens through the head plate. So the head plate is this top uh, heavy stainless steel piece here um, that has all these fittings on top. And um, this is a typical arrangement of the head plate. Now, th all these fittings are removable so that they can be um, placed in um, whatever is the optimal position for the type of fermentation you're going to be operating. This is how this particular vessel is set up for the green fluorescent protein uh, expression that we're using. So we have the head plate here and you ha have these six um, bolts uh, around here that actually mount the head plate to the stand and hold the vessel together. Below the head plate is this clamping plate. So this clamps the vessel in place. Here you can see the vessel. I have here one that's outside and you see it has a flange around the top. And it's actually sandwiched between the head plate and the clamping plate. So it's clamped in place. One thing I'd like to point out at this time is that on the bottom of the head plate, uh, let's see, I'll actually pull this one off over here. On the bottom of the head plate is this O-ring. So this O-ring actually seals the top of the vessel. Now that's important for a couple reasons. One, it obviously seals the vessel to prevent leakage. The other thing, it provides a cushion between the glass and the metal. It's really important that all these connections, that there's always a piece of rubber uh, or some material that's bet between the glass and the metal because the glass and the metal have different thermal expansion coefficients. And these go in autoclave and they get heated and then cooled. So if, if it's metal on glass, glass almost always loses. And so you could wind up cracking the vessel. Where it actually fits into the stand, like this when it's being assembled, you can actually see that there are three pieces of rubber that actually work as kind of cushions and bushings um, for that also for the purpose of isolating the bottom of the vessel from the metal so that we don't have metal on glass. Um, so I can maybe just use this one since I've got it in my hand here as a notion of the of head plate. And this is very well documented in the operation manual. And I'll show you the operation manual in a, in a little while. So it has demonstrations of these um, different things. Um, you'll see a couple of things on here where you'll see three small pieces of tubing or, or stainless steel tubing coming out. All right. These are called triports because they have three connectors on them. You see they go through to the inside where there are different things that, that carry through. So this is a way of getting material from outside into the vessel. One thing I'd like also to point out that I haven't already is that this is in order to grow the bacteria aseptically. That means that we don't want any other contaminants uh, getting in. So all this um, will be assembled, the media will be placed in it, and it'll be sealed and autoclaved with the media in it ready, um, ready to go. Um, you see we have a, here uh, three what we just call blanks. Uh, so they're not being used uh, at this time, so they're just put in to fill up the space. There's also a, a pretty interesting one here called the thermal well. Right. The thermal well is going to be where the thermal couple is inserted in order to monitor the temperature. So I the thermal couple is going to monitor the um, temperature of the media and send it back to the control unit. Now, when we talk about the pH probe and the DO probe, those are autoclaved in place. They're autoclaved along with the media. 
the uh, thermocouple cannot be autoclaved. So it's kept um, away uh, or not placed in the vessel for, for its autoclave. So since it's not going to be sterile, it has to be in a closed system. So this thermal well is a sealed uh, tubular um, container so that the thermocouple will actually be inserted in it. And we'll actually have to add um, a little glycerin in to there to be able to allow the, the um, um, temperature convection to get to the thermocouple um, to um, tell the temperature. So that's the thermal well. Um, 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 we have this triport here that has the uh, harvest tube, which is a tube that goes to the very bottom of the vessel, which is used in h harvesting. Um, we have a um, sample tube, which goes about halfway down the vessel, which is used if you want to collect a sample. And we'll be talking later about the sampling apparatus, which mounts onto here. And then there's a short, just auxiliary tube uh, that could be used for any other additions that, that you may want to make. The other triport on this side has is controls this loop here. That's a continuous loop comes in, goes around. That. That's a cooling coil. That's where cooling water comes through um, if the vessel gets too warm and it calls for uh, cooling. Then a solenoid allows water to percolate or circulate through it. And then the third part of the triport is what we call the sparger. It's a smaller uh, tube inside the cooling coil. And you notice it um, doesn't go all the way around and it has a little rubber cap on it. Uh, when you look at it closely, it has very small kind of needle sized holes in it. The sparger is going to allow air to, to be introduced into the media. So that uh, filtered air would be entered into the sparger, it would come and bubble up through the um, media. And meanwhile, the impeller is um, turning to create the circulation of the media. These um, uh, blades are kind of paddle blades. You see, they're kind of flat. They look like the blades on an old paddle wheel uh, boat, but they're f flat blades. These are impeller blades, and this is the impeller shaft. And they're adjustable up and down depending on the volume that you um, have in your vessel. Um, there are different kinds of blades that could be used in vessels, such as pitched blades, but it depends on the type cell that you're using. But we're going to be using uh, E. coli, which is a, is a bacteria. Um, Okay, then there's this kind of port um, here. This is for the, the exhaust condenser. We'll be talking about that in a bit also. Um, but it's just an open stainless steel fitting that has three set screws in it that allow it to clamp down on the stainless steel condenser. These other two port here are, are multi-part ports. They're actually... Let me take one out here. They actually have two metal parts. And then inside, there's a Teflon fur roll. Right? And it's two parts. And these um, um, are for are used for the pH probe and the DO probe. Um, what you don't want to happen, or what you don't want to do, okay. here's our pH probe, which is glass. Right. What you don't want to do is try to force that glass pH probe down through one of these fittings, because you're likely to crack it, and these are not cheap, plus it's probably not safe to shatter glass. So 
in order to mount them, we actually assemble these. onto the probe and oops, let me get this back out. Then we can place the probe in and then we tighten the fitting. And as it's tightened, that fur rule is compressed so it holds it tightly. So so if you loosen the fitting, you can slide it up and down. Once you tighten it, it'll stay in place. What I prefer to do as it's being autoclaved is autoclave it in the completely down position. That sterilizes the entire uh, um, probe. Then when you're operating it, if you want to pull it out a bit, then then you can, but if you autoclaved it and left this exposed and push it down, you could be introducing uh, organisms into the vessel. Um, but so that's a multi-piece um, okay. You also notice at maybe if I put it against my hand here, you can see it. At the base of the fitting are these two O-rings. There's a Teflon one and a butyl rubber one. Right? And so at the base of each one of these fittings, even the blanks, there are two O-rings. And the Teflon one, as we're looking, goes up, and the O-ring, or the butyl rubber one, goes down. So this is also to a buffer from the metal to metal. Now, Metal is both stainless the steel. They have the same expansion coefficient, but um, it's good to have these um, spacers in here, even even so, to keep them from uh, kind of uh, locking up and to have a cushion. So, uh, as you're assembling your vessel, it's always a good thing to go and check all your before you start putting your probes on and whatnot to check all your fittings to make sure that each have these two. Um, two O-rings with them. Um, um, over here, um, I kind of um, don't want to forget this guy. This guy's called the baffle, right? And so, um, if I can get it on here, it's a trick. It's a trick. So it goes on here so that it. Like I say, these blades um, kind of oppose the circulation that the impeller is um, giving to the media to create turbulence. So, like I say, the, the, the faster the RPMs of the uh, impeller, then the more oxygen that you're going to be um, putting in. And the control unit is going to control the uh, RPMs of the motor. <coughs> So speaking of the motor, here's what the motor looks like. This part, um, this heavy stainless steel piece that comes out of the top, um, has various functions. It's actually the motor mount. You can see this is where the impeller actually uh, is controlled by this turning. Inside here are bearings. So we say this is the bearing housing because it houses the bearings. Um, it's also referred to as the drive unit because it's part of the drive assembly and this is the motor that aligns with these pins on the side of the drive unit and so it'll actually uh, drive the impeller. This unit will then plug in, this cable will plug into the control unit and um, which will control the uh, RPMs of the motor. Um, this one over here you can see has this 
black piece of rubber over here. That's actually used in place when you're autoclaving the unit to keep um, uh, moisture from getting into the, into the bearings. Um, Oh, while we're talking about that, one of the kind of key things as you're handling, um, assembling and disassembling the unit, if you're ever wanting to lay it down, always allow the head plate to rest on the uh, bearing housing. Never let it tilt down and rest on either the uh, sparge or cooling assembly or if it's not on the impeller, because you're likely to bend the impeller shaft, and that's not a good thing. So anytime you're handling it, just have it um, rest on the drive assembly. It's not going to hurt it. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at how we actually assemble the vessel prior to autoclaving it um, in order um, to prepare it. Um, uh, let me get this off. So this is pretty much assembled um, uh, as it should be. Then we have this, the baffle to put in. And I prefer to have the baffle, the opening in the baffle, this uh, um, with the, um, um, so that the uh, sparger and the cooling um, are kind of, not in its way, right? And so then we um, whoops, slide the vessel on. And see if I can get it to go. All right. Now, you notice as we put it in the sparger which has friction against the vessel did not go down with the rest of it. So through one of the open ports like this one, I'm going to have to find something to push that down. And you can use pretty much anything. I, I kind of stay away from metal um, um, so that I don't kind of accidentally crack the vessel. Um, but I can see the uh, perfect there, so I can actually then just push it down um, to a, from about an inch or so um, from the bottom. Some of the larger vessels actually have a little tab that comes off of the um, baffle so that it gives you a, a wider um, target um, to push down on. So now I've got everything in the vessel um, sort of like I want it. And So then to assemble the top, I'm not going to put all these on because I may want to take it apart again, but um, just kind of a little housekeeping thing. These all have an O-ring that fits between the head plate and the uh, uh, nut here. Um, and it has kind of a, what I call a kind of curved smooth side, kind of a flat rough side. Now I just prefer to have the flat rough side up toward the uh, nut so when it's tightened down it doesn't have that rough part just cutting into the head plate which it wouldn't really wouldn't hurt anything but just cosmetically uh, uh, um, more please. I'm just going to put a couple of them on there. Now notice most all these fittings have knurled um, uh, surface, and that's so you can get a grip on them. There's no point at any time during any operation to use any mechanical advantage, like a wrench or a pair of pliers or something to try to tighten these beyond hand tight. Um, um, when you do that, you're going to, um, you know, nothing good's going to happen. I'll just say that. So now if I've got all six on there, I've got the head place, head um, plate affixed. Ah, one thing I should have pointed out. Earlier I showed you the O-ring, 
that was on the bottom of that. It's a good practice to um, use some silicon lubricant, which is kind of a grease, uh, on all the rubber fittings, the both the O-ring that goes on the base of the head plate and also the little small rubber O-rings that are going to fit down at the bottom of all the um, uh, fittings. Okay, so we've got the head plate in place. The triports kind of live there. And so now we have the um, things that are going to add um, um, to the top. Now I've already um, gone over how these triport or these um, multi-piece um, uh, fittings work. So we have to assemble those whoops, off and then put it in place. Um, things to note, okay, you don't want the pH probe, you just make sure it's not hitting the impeller because that would obviously crack, break the glass. But if it's um, put in and it's straight, it shouldn't um, be near the impeller. Also, when, when you're assembling and you're putting the thermal well in, remember here's the thermal well, you don't want it to be close to the cooling coil because that would confuse it because it would always be cool and it would be putting in heat, ask for more cooling, it's still cool, ask for more heat. So you would overheat the vessel just because it was misreading the temperature. So just make sure your thermal well is not proximal or not near to the um, uh, cooling coil. Um, you notice the pH probe here has this red cap on it. This is called a shorting cap. So it's used uh, during storage and also during autoclaving. But you'll remove this to attach the connector when you're um, actually operating the vessel. Um, you see, this is the DO probe, and it similarly has cap. It has a cap at each end. This cap you'll take off. It's only used in storage. Um, but this shorting cap is also used in autoclaving. So we're going to insert it in just a second. But I'd like to point out there are some, there are some threaded fittings here in an O-ring actually up on the top of the shaft. You'll notice there's kind of a similar type of threads here on the pH electric. Those aren't used with this vessel. Right? These are used if... This actually, this probe can be used on a large stainless steel vessel where this would actually go through the wall of the vessel and, and actually screw in and seat into the side of the vessel. So, um, uh, not to be confused, they're um, just not for use with the, the vessels that we have. Um, so, let me quickly... get this one assembled and I like to do it also like I do the pH probe and get it, get it autoclave in the top position okay that's okay so then that would tighten down And so now we've got our pH probe and our DO probe. Now we've got our um, um, exhaust condenser here. Now the, the purpose of the exhaust condenser is you're um, um, incubating this at above room temperature. Say if it's 33, 37, it's going to create a little evaporation. Um, well, if, you're, if you evaporate too much media or water, it's not going to evaporate the salts. It's just going to evaporate water. That's going to increase 
the osmolarity of your media because the salts aren't being evaporated. The water is, so it's going to increase the concentration. So one way to prevent that loss is to condense the vapor as it's evaporating and let it get dripped back into the vessel. So there's actually um, an inner wall and an outer wall. So um, the um, we'll have cool water circulating from bottom to top through here to cool the the outer wall. Then inside there we have this kind of helical um, uh, stainless steel rod that condenses the w water and lets it drip back into the vessel. Now, being that it's made out of stainless steel, if I can get it back on here, then we don't have to use one of those multi-part um, uh, fittings. We use this stainless steel fitting with the three set screws. Now, I guess there are a couple ways of, um, of approaching how you attach it. Since it's um, uh, metal and it's not breakable, um, um, it's okay to loosen your set screws and insert it directly through the fitting. And then you have to re-tighten the fitting. Now, the problem with doing that is at the bottom of the fitting are these two fittings, one of which is that little rubber O-ring. So if you're putting it through there and you hit that little O-ring, the notion is that it would force it on to there and, uh, and all would be good. In practicality, what happens often is you're trying to force it through. It actually catches it and pushes it into the vessel and you see it just float to the bottom. Okay. So I prefer to do it kind of like the, the multi-part and assemble it out here. Well, and then it would go on like that and then you can Oops, I got it too far in there anyway. And then you can assemble it on there. Now, my preference is when you're putting it on there to look through and make sure that it's going all the way through the head plate and the clamp plate, but not much further. But if you push it all the way down, it gets close to the liquid level, particularly if you happen to have a whole liter in here. Then it's going to bubble a little bit with the air coming in, and it's going to, those bubbles are going to try to go up the condenser and create moisture in there. So my preference is to have them through the plates, but just enough so that you see them through the plate. And then you can adjust... Um, the position with the th with the three set screws. Although one set screw is always going to be on the back where you can't get to it because there's three. So um, before I get it tightened all the way in, when I know about where it's going to be, I tighten one that I'm projecting to be in the back, and then I can get to the other two. And so let me get this one over here. Okay, so we're getting closer. We've got our condenser on our probes. Um, um, now there are some other tubing things and whatnot that go in. Um, um, we've got this set of tubing, and notice it's got this filter on it. So the filter has kind of a larger piece of tubing and then a step-down fitting that goes to the smaller tubing. So all these fittings on this vessel are this really small tubing, but a lot of things that connect to are larger. So you'll have a number of these kind of different size unions of the tubing. Right. So, um, so this is your airline that is going to um, actually take air to the sparger. So this is going to hit, it's going to connect to the, sp to the sparger. Um, so 
the spargers on this triport, and all tri the triports have three different um, uh, size tubings. And um, so I'm trying to see. Anyway, the so this is going to hook to uh, or just and it just slips over. So these these are stainless steel tubings. This is just a little um, plastic tubing, silicon rubber actually. So it's going to go over there. So we've got this thing and it's just going to hang here for a minute. Um, now this is will be the uh, cooling coil. Now it's a closed system. So it can stay open if you want. Sometimes out of habit, if you will, I'll close it with a loop, little loop of tubing. But it's not necessary for the cooling coil because it's not open into the vessel. Over on this side, this triport is the harvest sampling triport. So those are open. So one of them we're going to hook to our sampling, um, which is the middle size one. And so what I'm going to do is put this loop over the, sa over the um, harvest and auxiliary. Um, um, to close them off so that nothing will get in and contaminate the vessel during then the this is the kind of sample sampler assembly that will hook on to the sample port and then you can just uh, attach Here now for autoclaving, I usually leave it a little loose and pull it in, so that it, I can actually fit two vessels in the autoclave at one time. But for operation, it would be out like this. It has these two clips on it, and you can clip those closed during the autoclave so that no, it doesn't fill up the sample vessel. Now, if you're actually wanting a sample in the middle of the run then you'd attach a syringe to um, this lure lock here and open both these ports, draw the some vacuum into the syringe and it would, because it has a negative pressure here, it would pull sample into this vessel. This one. And you can actually, I don't have one of the caps here, but there's actually a cap that fits it. So you could take this off, cap that sample and put another sterile um, um, bottle on there. So that's the sample apparatus. And since this is an open system, we need, so we need to close off this access. So we've got another filter here, and it's a piece of tubing. This going here. And um, this is not a factory accessory, but this is a, whoops, a spring that I like to put over this so that it's doesn't kink. Sometimes without it, the weight, you can see the weight of the of that wants to pull, crimp that. So if you put this little spring over it, then it still bends, but it keeps it from from crimping. And the one remaining thing that we have here, we have this port. Let me take it off. It's a smaller version of the multi-part port because it also is small and it has um, fittings in there, a little fur rule. Now, I'm not going to take it apart because these things are sure to jump and, and roll somewhere. Um, but... These 
are where you insert what we call the level probes. And so since they're metal, we can actually insert them without taking the, the, the taking it completely apart. You see I have a couple here. They're different lengths. Um, and so there are multiple links available depending on what you're wanting to monitor. So, so they fit in like so. Right. And also by adjusting the the tightness of them, then you can tighten it down. on the probe to adjust the, the height that you want it. And so these are ways of measuring um, basically the liquid in there or whether or not the liquid is foaming um, because these just know whether or not they're wet or dry. And, and so depending on what you're monitoring, these will take information to the level monitor and control. You may want to add some anti-foam if it's foaming. You may want to add some sterile water if the volume is um, too low or whatnot. So these are um, level probes. Okay, so the next thing we would do, I'm not going to do here in the demonstration, but we'd actually add our media to be autoclave to the vessel. And um, typically we'll add um, about 900 mils of media. Um, the vessel totally full I think is 1.3 liters um, but we need some volume of air um, to work with so kind of the maximum operating volume that I use for these is a liter and so I'll start with 900 mils of media and then when we actually get ready to do our uh, culture we'll add 50 or 100 mils of the transformed organism to the vessel if we're ready to start the um, ex protein expression. But so we've got, as, assume that the, the media is in there and we've got this all sealed up, except for we have these um, 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 filters. Um, now the filter is on there to keep um, 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 you know, it's keep things out when we're adding, in this case this is always open, or in this case the sparger when we hook air to it um, uh, to um, uh, uh, keep it in. Now, if you'd added this, if this were sterile tubing and you added this sterilely, then you could um, not worry about wrapping the filter, but assuming this has been in a drawer somewhere, um, then you want to autoclave the filter as well. So we actually wrap them with foil. I hope I've got enough here. And we actually kind of put the filter there and we kind of wrap it like this. And some people say it's wrapping it like a tulip because I think it kind of looks like a tulip. So you would uh, you do it to this one, you would also I don't I guess I've got enough up there but barely. Uh, right. So you would autoclave it like that which allows steam to get to the filter and then as soon as you open the autoclave to get it out then you close the tulip down right, to keep uh, anything from uh, um, getting in there and then you can store these um, um, until you're ready to use them. So often, th because of the way the class works, you know, we wind up autoclaving these, getting ready to autoclave, you know, at one class and we're not ready to set up the fermentation that day, usually the maybe the next class period. So, um, they can just um, sit here, they're all sealed up until you're ready um, um, to uh, 
use them. And, and, and the way our classes work, usually, um, you know, your fermentation or your culture is going to have to run for at least 24 hours, maybe 48 hours. So um, it, it tends to work better if you would do it on the, on the first day of a week so that then that allows it to go 24 or 40 hours and then you harvest it as opposed to starting it, say, on a Wednesday or Thursday and not coming back till Monday or, or Tuesday where it just sets in the ferment or uh, smelling up things and hopefully not leaking on the counter uh, for, for that number of days. So we autoclave it, it comes out of the autoclave. Um, um, we're going to, uh, in a uh, minute, we're going to move this to the, to the control unit to show how it hooks to the control unit. But while we've got it here on this nice open table, I want to show some of the, the um, some of how it hook, they hook up to the actual vessel. Uh, here's the heating blanket, and it's really just like a, like a heating pad kind of thing. It has inside here are a bunch of copper resistance wires that electricity goes through there and generates heat. So it's just going to mount, and it has these um, 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 Velcro. Velcro thing. They have these Velcro, uh, you know, so that they'll just fit. Um, together, so it just wraps around when you're going to be attached. Just wraps around and then seals. It has some ports in here, some some circles, and I like to put those kind of toward the front so I can see what's going on with the impeller and make sure the air is coming up from the sparger. But that's the the heating blanket, so it'll be on there. Um, Here's what the um, thermocouple looks like, although um, in um, um, bioprocessing terms, we call this an RTD, um, but it's a thermocouple that goes into the thermal well, and then this will fit onto the appropriate, um, and remember that this didn't go through the autoclave, so it doesn't have to be sterile. Um. This is the cable for the pH probe. And you notice this red cap looks just like the red cap on the, uh, uh, the shorting cap. So that's where it'll mount. And then on the other end is a BNC connector and just what looks like a little stereo plug. This is for the ground and this is for the active signal to go through. Okay. This is the connector for the DO probe, so this stainless steel that marries on uh, to where this shorting uh, and fits on here. Now, uh, it's difficult to see, but there's one little um, copper connector here that's a little bit longer and bulges out a little bit more than the other, and there's a place that it lines up. So this is kind of a, a pain to get on, uh, you just have to make sure that it's aligned properly and then it'll go on um, fairly reasonably. But that's for the DO probe. Um, and when we've got the vessel over by the control unit, I'll show you the uh, DO connectors. Okay, so here we've got our uh, vessel. Assume it's out of the autoclave, it's ready to um, hook up to the control unit. Here we have the control unit that we're going to be set up to operate this vessel. Um, these are the various modules that we're going to connect uh, to make our control loops. And this is the control unit that we're going to program to tell what temperature or what speed of agitation, what amount of dissolved oxygen or whatnot that we want. So we've got to um, connect all this telemetry up, these cables to um, to the device. And there's no particular order that they have to go in. Um, um, I usually like to hook up the water and the air um, first. Um, now, we're going to have water coming in 
for two purposes. One for cooling the condenser, it's always on, and then we'll have water that goes to the cooling coil that is controlled by the solenoid here so that it's just turned on when it, when it wants to be cool. Right. So we have this tubing, this braided tubing that comes in from the faucet or your um, chilled water source and it's going to hook to the back of the solenoid. So let me get it back out of the way now. Right. Now, coming off of it, if you can see through here, there's a T. And this smaller tubing that's not braided is going to feed to the bottom of the condenser. And then we have another drain line that's going to go back to the sink or to the recirculating unit and it goes to the top. Right. Now, to feed the cooling coil, we have to have one of those tubings that is a step-down tubing, because remember the cooling coil is a small tubing, and the solenoid is large. So it goes from the solenoid to one side of the cooling coil. And so since the cooling coil is a, is a closed loop, it doesn't matter which side you make the in and which side you make the out. Um, now, before I'm finished, I'm going to have to get a small tubing to run to the drain or to the recirculating unit um, from this side. But for right now, um, I'm just going to leave that open um, while I hook up the other thing. So the air... <coughs> It's going to be supplied just by pump. This is just like an aquarium pump. In fact, it is an aquarium pump. Um, um, but this particular one can actually could run two, two vessels. Cause it, and you see it has a small... Um, and so this is going to take a small piece of tubing. Right? And you can't see it so much on this side of the vessel is a flow manometer. You can probably see it right here on this other unit that's beside it. And it just it's has just a knob that controls and there's a little bead that flows up it goes up the, the the more air that comes in. So air is going to come in the bottom and then back out the top and hook to the sparger. Okay, so I'm going to show you, like I say, on this one that's here, but it, the actual uh, 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 manometer for this control unit would be over on the other side, but the fittings are just the same. So I've attached a small tubing to the air pump with this step up. So I'm going to slide it back out of view here. And so it goes to the bottom connector on the flow manometer and then at the top when this larger tubing will fit on it at the top and then we'll go into the filter. So now we've got the air loop for the sparger and we've got the water loop. Let me go ahead and attach this drain line. Well, I'm thinking a minute. To go to the drain. So now we've got our water loop. We still got our we've got our heating blanket on here. We've got our water, we've got our air. Um, now we need our pH connector. So this goes on to the shorting cap position. screws on and then this is the connector for the B and C connector and the ground so it goes on 
and plugs in there. Now back here is the DO probe. Then that lines up and tightens up. And then the trick to all these kind of plastic fittings here is they have um, kind of multiple configurations, but you kind of have to, they always have kind of little ears here that you have to line up with um, uh, slots here. So get those lined up. So now you, we've got our DO probe, we've got our pH probe, uh, we need our heater. Mm. Now agitation is the motor. We don't have a motor on there yet, so we can put our motor on. Once again, aligning the little slots there with the pins. Just kind of twist it and jiggle it into place. So we have our agitation. Now we've got temperature. So this is our RTD thermocouple. And um, I'm not going to do it for de this demonstration, but you're going to need to add a mil or so, milliliter or so of glycerol or glycerin, same thing, to the well. Or, so it goes to the bottom of that. And Then plugs in a so, and now we've got the level probe. So this is kind of it shorting cap. It goes, just snaps on to the level probe. And then it has this kind of old school alligator clip that just grounds to the head plate. And then you have three levels. It says foam, wet on, or wet off. Okay. And so actually the foam is for anti-foam and it would be kind of a wet on also. And so what it's doing is it's controlling these pumps. So it's going to, if it's foam is if it says it's getting wet from the foam, it's going to turn on a pump that's going to pump anti-foam in. So just for the sake of this, I'm going to plug it into the uh, wet on. Okay, so this is pretty much the connections for the standard uh, operation that you'll be doing. Now, there are some other uh, things. Like I said, for instance, if there were anti-foam to control these pumps or, or, or that needed the pumps, then you might have a bottle here. This would be the type of bottle you use for your anti-foam. And actually, they can be autoclaved. See, it's got a little uh, screw here. I've got it taped on there so it doesn't get lost. But you take obviously take the tape off, and you could actually screw it into one of these holes in the bottom um, of the plate. Or if you take that screw out, you can actually mount it on the head plate up here, so it can be autoclaved along with the vessel. Or you can autoclave it separately. But in that case, you'd have your say your bottle of anti-foam. I'm going to set it over here on the bench rather than um, have it there. But um, it would run through one of these pumps. Let me run it through this. Now this is a peristaltic pump. So it's made so that as it goes around, I'll show you, it has the rollers on it that actually squeeze the tubing between the roller and the wall of the pump. So Basically, 
you make a loop. Anyway, so you need to see this one is pumping in this number four is a clockwise pump. So it's coming in here. Whoops, I haven't got it all the way in there. Yeah. So then it would be, this would then go to a small tubing that would attach, say, to your auxiliary port to add your uh, antifoam. So it would be only turned on when it needed um, um, that to be pumped. So this unit has potentially four um, different um, liquid additions um, that it could do. Okay, and what I have here is the operator's manual for the um, fermenter. This is a BioFlow 110 modular bench top fermenter. I said this is the operator's manual. It's very comprehensive. It's pretty easy to read. It covers pretty much everything you need to know to operate the control unit and assemble and, and uh, use any of the vessels associated from our one liter vessel up to a 14 liter um, vessel, which we also, um, we also have the 14 liter vessel. We just rarely make 14 liters um, um, of a batch, um, but and it also has information on the control unit. A uh, particularly important, I'm going to point out uh, two items. Um, one on page 67 is calibrating the pH probe because you're going to each op each run, each fermentation run, you're going to have to calibrate the pH electrode and the DO probe, and it's important that you follow the instructions here because it has to be done in a specific set of steps. Um, there's a appropriate time to push each individual selector button on the control panel. And it'll say, push now, <laughs> don't push. Uh, so on page 67 is for the pH probe and on page um, 82, is for the DO Pro. So we tend to use these on each operating run, but it's, um, like I say, the, the operator's manual has pretty much everything you need to know to um, set up and run the BioFlow 110. And these um, usually live in the room where the fermenters live in one of the wall cabinets. Um, and uh, we have actually, we have six um, fermenter units, so we have six, six operators manual. This kind of concludes our um, video today. This is for the setup and operation of a one liter um, fermentation vessel, actually 1.3 liter with one liter operating capacity for the BioFlow 110 benchtop fermenter. And you see we have m multiple units here, so we have capability of running six fermenters at the time. Each control unit can operate up to four, uh, four vessels and so in our lab we have them set up. This control unit runs um, two, potentially two vessels. And uh, this is pretty much what it looks like. This is almost the simplest configuration. You can imagine if we had um, some more uh, say acid and base running through, through here that it would get even more um, like a conglomeration of spaghetti, um, but uh, it's a little bit tedious, but um, uh, it's a, uh, a nice system, and this is typical of uh, benchtop fermenters, and it actually represents the operation parameter of a full-size 
um, uh, fermenter. They are obviously larger, but the same operating parameters in terms of oxygen and temperature um, and pH uh, uh, still apply. So um, once this is once you're uh, run, this would you know you'd you'd inoculate after you got this set up and got your oxygen your and everything um, calibrated and stabilized. Then you would add your inoculum, which is usually uh, an eight to 24 hour culture that you've grown in, like I say, a, a 150 or 100 mils. You'd introduce it to the fermenter, let it uh, um, culture for uh, 24, 48 hours, and then you would harvest it. So you can actually connect a tubing to the harvest tube and actually withdraw the sample from uh, from the fermenter, and that would conclude. That would then begin your downstream processing. So this um, setting up your media, getting everything set up, is kind of upstream. You add your inoculum, uh, grow the bacteria. That's kind of the transformation or the um, process where the organisms are actually making the protein that you're interested in. Then you're going to harvest the vessel and start your downstream processing where you would actually then get the protein from the media and then go through the purification process.